Hi, I'm Lisa Doran. I'm the Deputy Director for Curatorial Affairs and the Curator for Contemporary Art at the Williams College Museum of Art. And I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Matthew Coolidge and Aurora Tang. Uh, Matthew is the founding director of the Center for Land Use Interpretation, and Aurora is an independent researcher and curator and has served as the center's program uh, manager since 2009. Their talks uh, today are called In Outside In, the Edges of the USA, and Inside Out, the Centers of the USA, respectively. Please join me in welcoming Matthew Coolidge. Well, hello. Thank you for inviting us out here. It's wonderful to be in this nice, rainy place for a change for us Southern Californians. Uh, yeah, and now for something completely different, I guess. We'll be uh, looking at the totality of America in you know, 20 minutes each or so, uh, but we'll be doing it in a bridge fashion, of course, uh, looking at the sort of edges, and then Aurora will be doing a, uh, a search for the middle ground, a search for the center, in a sense. Uh, but I wanted also just to provide a tiny bit of background about our organization, since uh, not everybody has heard of us yet. <laughs> Maybe none of you have, I don't know. But this is our logo, which is round and geometric. So obviously we have a great interest in the edges and the middles already, just looking at the graphic design of this very simplistic logo. Uh, we've been around as an institution since 1994, uh, and, uh, and our focus is on the built landscape of the United States, which is everything, because all of the surface of the earth has been transformed by humans, and therefore, whether it's intentionally or incidentally constructed, it's a human construct. Uh, and that's a given that we start out with. Uh, we look at the, this transformed landscape, this anthropogenic landscape, you could say, uh, just within the United States, because we're interested in America, whatever that is, and we're interested in the culture of America as inscribed on this landscape. The entirety of the landscape, as I say, is, is constructed. It's an artifact, right, because of environmental forces from the, uh, the physical transformation of the ground itself to the weather or whatever that also has an effect on it. Uh, but it also is a, a cultural product that can be read like uh, archaeological uh, a specimen, which is in fact what we do. We kind of broke down the whole country into an archaeological grid and said, you know, did an examination of the different land uses that occur within this landscape. And that's obviously an ongoing process. Uh, it takes forever, it's infinite, but we still decided to do it and continue to do it. And we draw from this collection of information. Every place we look at has a latitude and a longitude. It's locatable. You can say, this is there. Whether or not you can go there is another question, but for us, the raw material of our organization is data about place, and that place is a, is a locatable place. So we deal directly with this idea of ground truth, uh, where the, the truth, or at least facts, or something like facts, can be found in the terrain. But of course, the ground itself, by itself, means nothing. So I like to start out showing this slide because this is really where we work in this kind of informational realm above the landscape. So here you've got the ge the, some kind of plaque that was plopped down that says something about a site, uh, a place, a piece of earth that by itself means nothing without interpretation. So that interprets it. And then the guy with the hat's reading the interpretive plaque that interprets the place. And then the guy with the camera making a video about the guy with the hat who's reading the interpretive plaque that interprets the place. And then there's the photographer making all of this visible, who is themselves invisible, taking a picture of the guy with a video camera, making a documentary about the guy with a hat who's reading the interpretive plaque that interprets the site. And it goes on and on and on. This is the interpretive realm, the informational realm, the kind of floating sphere of notions that floats above this inner ground. Uh, and there's doesn't stop there either. There's me telling you about the photographer taking a picture of the guy, and then there's maybe you telling somebody about me telling you. But anyway, so on and on. And this, this is where we work in this interpretive arena. We also, as a fundamental principle, think about 
how you can have the sort of paradox of the multiplicity of points of view around any given space, all of them valid, all of them meaning something, all of them significant, and yet even if they are contradictory, they have to coexist, and they must, and they do. And this, in a sense, is another way of talking about that centrality, that inward notion. Uh, and that's something we keep in mind with all of what we do. So we collect information and, I, and blurb uh, little descriptions and take pictures and create online maps and databases uh, and extract from this database an image archive to do exhibitions and programs for the public. These are the primary categories, everything we, all of land use, <laughs> believe it or not, fits into one of these categories and these, this is just our, our sorting system, but it gives you some idea of how we begin to organize information. Uh, and we make sure to revisit these different subjects so that uh, we don't dwell too much on one thing or another. Uh, so we make resources online. Our database is a searchable uh, resource open the public. We're not very proprietary about our images. They end up getting used to illustrate publications and things. Uh, and our primary audience is on the internet uh, as an organization growing up starting in 1994 or so, right around when the World Wide Web was beginning. The sort of connection between info space and physical space and that sort of synapsis or the, the disconnect, whatever you want to call it, uh, is very much part of what we're about, about the representation of space. Smithson, Robert, said there's a site and an on-site, as was brought up earlier, uh, where the site is the physical location, the non-site, the representation of that site. Maybe these days it's not a dialectic, it's a trialectic. Site, non-site, website. Where the website is this com compounded collection of perspectives linked to maps, linked to the infinity of imagery that exists for places these days. So this infosphere uh, is a new kind of space, arguably, and so that, that is kind of what we uh, do sort of uh, physically. Uh, and with having a searchable database and repre you know, representing a non-site version of the sites you know, on our website. Um, we also believe in people <laughs> and in going to places physically though, and in a way, this notion of ground truthing and physically going somewhere is, is fundamental um, to what we do. And so we spend a lot of time organizing trips and tours so that people can have direct experience with places, because no matter what you tell somebody about some place, until you've gone there and quote done that, you know, in a sense, you, you've never, you haven't really absorbed the the the, the site. You haven't really had an experience, uh, which with your body in the place. And we end up in very strange places on our bus tour sometimes, you know, bombing ranges and salt flats and. Uh, uh, Massachusetts, we, one time we did a tour out here for MIT, we ended up at Lincoln Labs and Hanscom Air Force Base. It was all very organized around this concept of C4I, the uh, communication control, countermeasures, intelligence, infrastructure that Route 128, Massachusetts Miracle sort of evolved. Anyway, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Desert Research Station, uh, which is one of our sites in the field, which is an interpretive center in the Mojave Desert, which looks at the kind of headroom around the city, the big metro region of Southern California. Uh, so it's open to the public with uh, information. It's also a center for uh, creating interpretive programs dealing to, with relating to the environment of that uh, high impact desert region. We also have a physical location where we've run a residence program for 20 years. Uh, supported partially by the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, creatively interpreting the region of the Bonneville Salt Flats in the Great Salt Lake area. Uh, and this is the old military base that was used for field testing uh, the atomic bomb before we went and delivered it. Uh, no radioactive materials out here is all the sort of uh, chemical explosive qualities, the, the fusing and firing of the bomb, so it's not like dangerous in that way. Uh, but the scientists from Los Alamos were going back and forth to Wendover, Utah, uh, which is a very dead place. So we stuck, we, the reason why we developed a center out there in a way, it's kind of a hole in the middle of America, kind of a backspace where a lot of this kind of stuff you don't want in your backyard goes. So there's all kinds of incredible, dramatic, unattenuated, historical things that have occurred there, including you know, the field testing of atomic weapons. Uh, and, it, and yet it's a dead place, meaning nothing grows because it's salty. It's not a human 
thing. It's actually just sort of salty. So as a relatively unpopulated place, it's drawn the things that like low populations. <laughs> but of course, it's not completely depopulated. There is no away. This is away. And it does have people, and that's part of what we look at out there. Um, creative programs of all kinds uh, all over the place. Uh, but primarily, we, we generate material out of our office in Culver City, uh, which is in Los Angeles. Uh, it's our main exhibition space. So we have several exhibits a year based on different uh, types of land use phenomenology. Uh, and then our exhibits travel around to different places. This was a Hudson River exhibit, which went from New York City to uh, Hudson, New York, or oh, Beacon, actually, and then up to Troy, the exhibit itself traveling up the region, which it depicted. It was about the shoreline of the Hudson and different kinds of land uses that have occurred there, up to the first physical barrier on the river, the dam at Troy. Uh, so we cover things regionally, we cover things uh, conceptually. This is another poster from an exhibit we did about the end of the Mississippi River. But I'm here to talk about something else entirely, uh, which uh, is this notion of peripheries and middles and the sort of dynamics between those two things. Uh, sometimes to better understand a place, you have to leave it, right? They say, uh, if you go away so that you can have perspective uh, uh, of the whole. Uh, so that's one reason the periphery is kind of interesting because uh, you see it when you kind of head towards the edge of a thing, you get a, a sense of the perimeter, the, the sort of shape of this great land mass. So with great apologies to Alaska and Hawaii, who for cartographic reasons and time reasons are left out of this discussion, we're just gonna look at the lower 48, as you will, uh, the, uh, the, the great continental the United States, uh, focusing just actually on four corners. Uh, and since we're in the Northeast, we can start with Maine, uh, the northeastern corner of the USA. Uh, Maine has 611 miles of border with Canada. Uh, it's quite a dramatic landscape of the border uh, between straight lines going over mountains and then rivers and over uh, all the kind of crest line of mountains between drainage systems of the St. Lawrence and the Atlantic. It's a very complex border. Uh, it's a place of meetings of culture between the Canadians, obviously, and the Americans and the Acadians, who uh, have a great presence up in the northern part of Maine especially, uh, and uh, as well as the native cultures. So the border typically runs through a lot of native terrain, of course, as well as actual reservations. Um, so just following the main line, I'm not gonna do the whole thing, but, uh, but this is the northeasternmost or the easternmost portion, I guess, of the northeast corner of the USA. It's this little rocky outcrop. It being Maine, it's right beyond a nice little lighthouse. So there's the easternmost peninsula coming here, uh, West Quaddy. And it's, uh, there it was got a big granite boulder making sure you're aware that it's the easternmost point in the USA. Uh, and it has a very nice little museum describing mostly the history of the lighthouse. Uh, and it's uh, open to the public. Uh, and uh, the, you know, this is the northeasternmost uh, or easternmost gift shop in the USA, again, it being Maine, <laughs> uh, but a uh, very scenic uh, place. Um, oh, yeah, even the interior of the gift shop is scenic. Uh, but then Maine has this funny shape to it, of course, so that's West Quaddy's there, the easternmost portion. The border actually comes in from here and kind of cuts up by Machias Island. And, um, and then, but you've got this up here, which is sort of, it's not quite as far east, but it certainly is much more north. So it bears some uh, representation in this notion of the northeastern corner of the USA. That's the top of that top. So this little funny corner up there is this funny corner here. So the entirety of Maine comes to a point, right? And, and it extends significantly above the, the 45th parallel, which is the border roughly for the top of Vermont and, and New York. Uh, 
Um, so Maine is this big sort of northern bulge. And this town, curiously, Escort, Maine is what this portion is called the, that's in the US. You can see the line actually goes right through a bunch of houses. These are tough places to pay your taxes on because you got to do it for two, two, yeah, literally two nations. And so uh, this is the line coming from south to north right through. So here's the Quebec side, uh, almost unpronounceable, Pohinagamuk uh, is the Quebec town and then Escort, Maine there. Uh, turning around, you see the monument. So this is the international boundary, U.S. over here, Canada over there. Uh, goes right through these folks back, their house as well as their back porch. Um, it's a French-Canadian town. Nobody in town is, is uh, English-speaking really natively. And so it's, a, it's very, even though it faces uh, America in a way, it's, uh, it's, it's a Canadian place. So there's the international boundary right there, looking through people's backyards the international boundary going right here. So this, this patio is in Canada, but most of the pools in the U.S. Uh, and then finally, it, <clears throat> the, the town hits the, well, the, the international boundary hits the peak in this tiny little park uh, where, yeah, right there. So this is the little park and there's the, the peak where there's this funny little bridge. Uh, the international bridge, as it's called, uh, which was rebuilt a little while ago, but it's built over the boundary. So even though it's built as a attraction, as a kind of a thing uh, that you're supposed to go look at, technically by getting on the bridge and crossing over it, you're breaking the law, unless you go immediately to the nearest point of entry, port of entry to make your declaration, which of course is ridiculous uh, because you're just going on this bridge that the tourist sign says, go to this bridge. So it's a weird space, an interstitial space between the two countries showing, it's meant to be a symbolic embrace of this great union between the two big trading partners adjacent to one another, yet it's a transgression to actually sort of use the bridge as it's intended, which is a curious sort of indication of the casualness of this uh, international space in terms of Canada, maybe, but it's also, a, it's a, funny kind of paradoxical environment as well. Uh, of course, the line runs across the country, uh, going through a few other towns, uh, Derby Line, Vermont. Uh, it goes underneath the uh, Detroit River. This is 70 feet below the surface in the Detroit River, the international boundary, uh, the only uh, subaqueous vehicular international tunnel in the world, I believe. <laughs> but, uh, and then it goes over through bridges, across the country. It hits this remarkable place called the uh, International uh, Peace Garden in North Dakota, where for a mile and a half or so, this is looking due west along the border. You have this weird mutation of the, the, this substanceless line, right? This, this border, which has no measurable thickness, becomes this kind of orchestra of, of landforms uh, and commemorations and gardens uh, all the way up to this building that was intentionally constructed on the international boundary in the Peace Garden, where it goes through the set of double doors and through the middle of this organ. So when you're there playing something patriotic, perhaps, on the organ, your left hand's in Canada and your right hand's in the USA. And then continues the line is this great like derive. I mean, the the, the 49th uh, runs uh, you know across about 1,200 miles across the, the western part of the country is a perfectly straight line right through mountains and everything perfectly straight sort of. I mean, there is some meandering based on surveying techniques, but it's supposed to be a perfectly straight line. And the cut lines managed by the International Boundary Commission. Canadians on one side, Americans on the other, 10 feet on either side of the right of way. So you end up with a 20 foot wide swath going through the forest as this great, you know, Goldsworthy like uh, structure artwork until it gets to Washington State where it sort of descends further, further into the ground, ultimately levels out in the plains as it heads to the Pacific. And it's a trench. Uh, it's a trench that you could literally hop across, so they've made it a bit easier for you by building little bridges through this park in Blaine, Washington, uh, where it's, uh, again, an intentional 
expression of the openness of the boundary, but it, I can assure you, if you hop over that, no problem, but as soon as you leave the park, they'll know that you hopped over it. There's cameras everywhere, and there's sensors everywhere. But that doesn't stop the community from really coming together uh, in this international park in a funny way. And then, of course, the boundary, that's Blaine, and then it cuts across this tiny little piece of British Columbia uh, called Point Robert. So that's actually part of Washington State, uh, which, uh, and then it you know, goes out the straits. Uh, but Point Roberts is about a four or eight square mile peninsula. And there's the boundary looking west through Point Roberts where it goes through the final, its last trampoline. Yeah, there's a lot of trampolines on the border. People who have backyards on the border can't build there because the cut line is supposed to be perfectly clear. And if you build there, the Boundary Commission will actually tell you you have to tear that thing down. One reason why they don't even accept permit applications to rebuild existing structures on the boundary with some very, very few exceptions because they're trying to keep the border between the two countries completely clear and visible. They don't want stuff there. So that backyard fence is probably 10 feet from the middle of the boundary line, but you can put your trampoline there because you can easily haul it away if they get mad at you for putting something there. So you find this kind of temporary architecture in the cut line space. And, um, until you finally hit at Point Roberts, the last big monument, Monument One, uh, which uh, was hauled around Cape Horn in the 19th century, and, and, and then it plops down the beach and then hits the water and dissolves into the ocean. And that's the northwest corner of the USA, but it's sort of not actually, well, or it is, but so that's Point Roberts. Like I say, it does this. So there is this, which is unspeakably further west, if not sort of more northwest. But anyhow, this little Cape, Cape Flattery, is another portion of this northwesternmost corner of the USA, and it's on a, a Native American reservation in La Caz, and it's, uh, though there is an overlook there, uh, it, uh, there, there aren't plaques and things saying that's the northwesternmost portion of the USA because it being a native reservation, they don't really care so much. Uh, and you see this quite often, especially on the northern boundary, uh, where several Native American reservations are bisected by the, by the line, the Mohawks in New York, probably the most famous case, uh, on the St. Lawrence River, where all the boundary monuments which are constructed by the federal governments of Canada and the US are, are often taken away by natives and they're buried or they're turned into fence posts, they're totally ignored, uh, so that the Boundary Commission kind of gave up restoring and maintaining those monuments. So in a strange way, the First Nation space of the Mohawk Res is, uh, is like a third nation within the middle of this, this international space. Uh, and it, that occurs in different ways across the border in some pretty interesting ways. But I'll quickly drop down, all the way down, to the southwest corner of the USA, uh, which is this um, international space. And of course, there's a lot more attention paid to the boundary of the uh, uh, Mexican boundary than there is to the Canadian one. But there it is on Google Earth. This zone here is the estuary of the Tijuana River. Uh, which so we the nations come together in a funny way there where the effluent from Tijuana goes up to America and then we pump it out of the, the river and process it through you know pollution control plants uh, because it comes out so contaminated that it makes it's, it's dangerous to the habitat that is there. This is one of the last remaining estuaries in the uh, Pacific coast uh, that hasn't been transformed of the U.S. Uh, and it's one of my favorite ev overlooks, if you will. It's an overlook that uh, has all kinds of uh, curious and obscure components. At first, this says, look around from the vantage point to see different ways landforms are made. Uh, and then this plaque talks about the disappearing wetlands, and, uh, the you know, big jet there and a bird there. Uh, there's an airport there and a military training field. and and so this, this panel talks about sort of the environmental problems of that particular estuary. Uh, and then this one is very obscure. Uh, yeah, somewhere you can make out of this murk 
uh, describes the military maneuvers. Uh, you know, the one thing you see over and over when you go to the margins of the country or even states in some cases, you find the things that, you, again, you don't want in the middle pushed to the edge, and so you often find military maneuvers and things going on around the edges of the continent uh, and closer to our, you know, the, the neighbors, in this case, in Mexico. But maybe the best thing about this particular overlook is the way it overlooks the actual border. Uh, that's the international fence here going into the ocean, assuring that only the best swimmers make it. But uh, it's also another kind of uh, uh, land arty kind of thing. It looks like Christo's running fence, and it run it does. And in, but now it's a double fence, so you have the one that runs into the ocean, which is still largely made out of old world uh, Vietnam era landing mat sections welded together, and then you've got this new fence. Uh, this is just a few years old, where it creates an international space, sort of. This is all in the US, but it's a space that's a restricted space, so it's kind of like a, a buffer between the two countries. Uh, it's a security zone, it's a swath. So if you think about the Canadian cut line as being this open space, very good for surveillance, yes, but that's not its intent. The cut line was meant to make the border visible on the Canadian border so that you wouldn't accidentally cross it. At least this is the Boundary Commission's argument. But in the Mexican border, where the entirety of the border, cut zone if you want to call it, is inside the US, it's a very different kind of space. It's a space of restricted access uh, rather than uh, to make it almost like some kind of commons, sort of, which is what happens sometimes on the Canadian border. This is a no man's land. Uh, in the monument, monument one on the Mexican border, which is also brought around the Cape you know, in the 19th century, is now not accessible without special arrangements, and you have to read the sign and do what the sign says. Maximum occupancy, 25 people. Uh, physical contact with individuals in Mexico not permitted. Exchange of items through, over, or under the fence is prohibited. Uh, so it's a very uh, uh, kind of controlled space uh, with some rules. But finally, you get in and you're able to go up to what used to be, you know, a very public space between nations in the old days, just a few years ago, you could actually touch people on the other side of the border and you could exchange things. And they did art projects like site projects. Remember we had all these great transborder art projects right here, but no longer, at least not to the same degree. Uh, and then there's the actual monument itself, which you can kind of ground truth if you go through all the various protocols. Uh, and of course, heading east from that point is this, you know, the fence, or the wall, uh, Vietnam landing mats in the foreground, but who knows what it's gonna be like in the future as it heads across the country all the way to El Paso where it hits the river and then follows Rio Grande out to the Gulf of Mexico. But the southeast corner is Florida, as you figured, uh, and it's a um, you know, different kind of space because it doesn't have the international boundary uh, right next to it. Uh, it's a little bit more uh, kind of open and touristy, uh, but it's a, yeah, so Key West is this island. Uh, there's the, you know, it's an island, so it wouldn't really count in some ways because in this sort of description of the periphery of the lower 48, you talk about the continental landmass, but it is part of the continental landmass because it's connected by this road, right, the Great Causeway that extends all the way out to the remote end of the Florida Keys, Key West. Uh, so it is, that's the connective tissue. And so the southernmost point is here, but it's not actually, as I got to admit. This is all a big air base, the Naval Air Station for Key West. There's their runway. So there are, there's civilian space, of course, the town and all of Key West and the uh, tour boats and stuff there. But it is also a strategic military outpost out into the uh, Caribbean, but, but you know, largely facing Cuba, uh, which was, has been a problem for us historically. So, but anyway, so this is the actual southernmost point uh, in the East Coast, uh, which, uh, and there's the overlook of it over there. Uh, the overlook is at a big solid point, uh, very indisputable, very popular. But beyond the fence is, like I say, the, the Naval Air Station with the telemetry and radar sort of 
uh, extending our sensitivity about what's going on beyond the national borders outwards to over the ocean, uh, over the, the Caribbean. But I just wanted to zip back up to Maine for one second uh, because, yeah, there is a connective line between the two. Uh, here's, which I skipped over, uh, Fort Kent, uh, which is not really part of the great landmarks of the northeasternmost point of the USA, but it's the point of origin for a road that goes all the way down to Key West. And it goes through a town that's slightly further north than Fort Kent, called Madawaska, uh, where they've established this Four Corners Park. So here we go around the Four Corners, and we could probably do this again and do, come up with a whole another <laughs> set of monuments in the Four Corners, but I'll stop there uh, with this encouragement that this is just one of the Four Corners of the USA, and, and the public, as well as motorcyclists, are, are welcome to come here. Uh, <laughs> But now, you know, after, in, incidentally, curiously, one of my favorite parts about this town is this paper mill. You can see the smokestacks, two smokestacks, one's in Canada, one's in the US, and they, they're connected by pipelines under the river because uh, it was cheaper to import a pulp than finished paper products across the border. So anyway, uh, things like that. Uh, but I'll, I'll let Aurora take over talking about the other side of this coin, if this is a search for understanding by the periphery, then she'll help out with the search for understanding by looking at the middle of everything. So thanks, Aurora. Okay, oops, sorry. Okay, sorry. I have to lower it a little bit. Um, um, thanks so much for having me here today. Um, to Christopher, uh, Rebecca, and everyone else at the Clark, it really is a treat to be here. Um, and so, let me just, here we go. As Matt mentioned, I'll be talking about the inside of the USA. So as you learn, there are many four corners of the USA. While you can look at the four corners of the continental US, um, you can also look at Four Corners Monument, an unusual cartographic landmark that marks the point where four states, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, and Utah converge. And it's the only place where this occurs in the nation. It's also the site of some borders of Navajo and Ute land and the US, between each other and with the US. So. Um, it is a far f uh, from most places that many people live, and so for many it requires a pilgrimage um, to obtain this geophotographic evidence that you can be in many places at once. So from this single point, you can uh, have your body extend cartographically to the limits of these four large southwestern states, and it's the sensation of being both on and in the map, where you have an awareness of your body in relation to the vastness of America. And uh, from here at this exact fixed point, you become locked down by both axes of the grid. And so here you can really get a sense of where you are. So there are also many centers of the USA. Um, and as the CLUI has followed the fringes of our nation, um, as Matthew described, um, we have also done projects uh, that look inward um, in search of the center. Um, so where is the center of the USA? And for some, it may be densely populated cities, cultural or economic centers, or maybe significant uh, national centers like um, places where widespread systems are centrally controlled and administered, like the White House or the Pentagon, um, or maybe the GPS control center at Triver Air Force Base outside of Colorado Springs. Or maybe company headquarters um, can be considered centers of control, as well as the control centers that they may operate, such as the AT&T National Control Center in Bedminster, New Jersey. Or maybe national transportation system control centers, like the Union Pacific um, Harriman Dispatching Center in Omaha that controls all the trains um, in the nation's largest railway. Um, but centers can also be determined by notions of geography, um, the population center, the geographic center, the geodetic center. Uh, these are just a few of the attempts there have been to describe the middle of the nation. And all are precise in their own way and all are sincere in their respective desire to find the heart of this big and complicated place. <laughs> 
Um, so the Center for Land Use Interpretation, uh, along with the, uh, our friends at the Institute of Marking and Measuring, or IMAM, uh, produced an exhibit called the Centers of the USA, uh, de depicting and describing uh, several of these different centers. So a version of it was uh, shown at our space in Culver City, um, as seen here. Uh, it was a little more multimedia. Um, and a version, oh, here, and it, of course, had tchotchkes. Um, and a version was also uh, shown in the center's mobile exhibition unit in Lebanon, Kansas, the geographic center of the 48 states, uh, which we'll speak more about. But uh, here it is at the opening, grand opening ceremony. Uh, with uh, Jesse Vogler and Louis Schock of Institute of Marking and Measuring, and some visitors that are here to celebrate with the, the ribbon cutting. And that's the taking a look at the exhibit. Um, but these centers attest to this persistent need to find the center point of a country or continent um, in order to point to the heart or find the middle or the core of a place. Each relies on a conceit, whether in the physical act of finding a balance point or in the approximation of the shape of the earth. The effort to name and locate a center affirms that there is a periphery. Because of the many ways to define both the periphery and the center, and because of the gap that always remains between an idealized representation and the physical fact on the ground, any precise center point is difficult to determine definitively. So this center then exists in many places, um, including perhaps here today. So we'll look at some of these centers. So the geographical center of North America is determined as the point on which this surface area of the continent would balance if it were a plane of uniform thickness. And so here it is in a lake in North Dakota. Um, but the closest town, oops, did I skip? This closest town is uh, Rugby, North Dakota. It's 16 miles away, sorry, and is quite proud of that. Um, it includes this central obelisk in uh, town that commemorates this, and it has many other interesting monuments and features, um, including this uh, Northern Lights Tower and Information Center. There's a museum dedicated to it with uh, stones from every state. Lots of obelisks, lots of tourist infrastructure and souvenirs. So we'll go to the center of the Northwest Hemisphere and it's the point halfway between the North Pole and the equator, one quarter of the way around the world from the prime meridian in Greenwich. Um, and that point is here in a field in Wisconsin. Um, it is marked nearby with this official looking sign and marker. But the actual site is a few thousand feet away as this sign indicates. This sign is mounted on the other sign. So the center of the 49 states, Castle Rock, South Dakota, or near Castle Rock, South Dakota. So the Twin Tops Mountain was declared to be the geographical center of the USA after the 49th state, Alaska, joined the Union in 1959. And they built this loop road with some picnic infrastructure and seating. Um, and, um, but that, it only stayed the center of the USA for about uh, seven months because Hawaii joined the Union. So it is no longer um, pretty active. There's uh, some concrete footing and some bathrooms left over. Um, but now moving on to the center of the 50 states, just nearby, about 10 miles away. Um, and uh, this is the geographic center of the nation now. So the 50 states, and it is in this field west of the Twin Tops Mountains in South Dakota. Although on private land and not officially open to the public, visitors climb through this cattle fence and walk out to the survey marker. Sometimes a flag is present inserted in the hole where a larger flagpole once stood. And this is the survey monument uh, marker um, marking the exact spot that's just a few feet away from that flag. 
Down the road is this abandoned farmhouse. Nearby is a fenced area that encloses a former intercontinental ballistic missile silo. A nice lock. And nearby is uh, also a remote continental scoring site that's operated by the Air Force's Nellis Range, which is located very far away in Nevada. But the closest town to it is Bell Force, South Dakota. And the town is home to the Center of the Nation Information Center, which celebrates this uh, centrality. It's a place of coming together. Here's an avenue of 50 flags, one for each state. Um, there's also picnic tables, bleachers, welcoming visitors to the site. There's also this granite uh, monument behind the visitor center. Uh, it's 21 feet in diameter, made of etched South Dakota granite, uh, with this 12-inch bronze marker from the National Geodetic Survey placed at its center. And so in 1918, the US Geological Survey declared that this point in a field uh, in north of Lebanon, Kansas, was to be the center of the nation, despite the crude process by which it was determined. Um, the shape of the lower 48 states was cut out of a sheet of cardboard and balanced on a point. Um, and so this point is located in this field in Lebanon, Kansas, or north of Lebanon, Kansas. In the 1940s, the local hub club developed a park for the center in a more convenient location though, with some expectations that could be built up perhaps to be a tourist destination similar to the Four Corners Monument. Highway 191, the shortest highway in the state, was built to connect this main road to the park. So here we are. A number of features here to greet visitors including a chapel on site. There's also a motel that was built there around the 50s, and at one point uh, I, I hear a coffee shop and a souvenir shop, um, that, but they didn't remain in operation for very long, just uh, closing after a few years. Two miles south of that monument is the town of Lebanon, uh, a former agricultural community with a sleepy downtown. If you want to go there and stay overnight, the closest um, town is that of Smith Center that has the uh, closest active motel for visitors to the uh, center. Nearby is the old cabin where the song Home on the Range was written. Another near... Another nearby landmark is in the other direction, Cocker City, home to the world's largest ball of twine. And so the Geodetic Center of North America is in the field north of the town of Lucas, Kansas, where it is marked with a small bronze geodetic survey marker. Known as Meads Ranch, this site is one of the most important surveying sites in the world. Uh, from 1901 to 1983, it was used as a datum point, anchoring one-sixth of the Earth's surface. And the significance of this site uh, to cartographers and surveyors is so great um, that apparently um, under this bronze marker is yet another one if something was ever to happen to this. The Google Center of the USA. So if you type USA into the search field on Google Maps and zoom in, it'll bring you to this edge of a small pond on private property two miles north of Deering, Kansas. Oh, there we are. Um, it's kind of a, a curious thing. A couple of years ago, uh, if you downloaded the uh, Mac version of the Google Earth application and zoomed in without entering a uh, location, a destination, then you were brought to um, an intersection in uh, Canute, Kansas, um, uh, the intersection of Maine and Lincoln, where you would find a uh, graphic of an earth on the, on the ground, on the intersection. And that was, I guess, the home of Dan Webb, who was a software engineer at the time. 
And then if you had the PC version of the application and zoomed in, you would get to an apartment complex in uh, Lawrence, Kansas, which the ho was the hometown of uh, the VP of engineering at the time. Oops, one more. Um, the population center of the USA. So in the 2010 census determined that the small Missouri town of Plato was the population center of the USA. The Census Bureau erected a monument in the center of town uh, near the bank and this gazebo um, and the post office. And the official mean center of population for the US is determined mathematically as the place where an imaginary, flat, weightless, and rigid map of the US would bounce perfectly if weights of identical size representing each of the 308 million or so people uh, were placed according to each individual's location. And so every 10 years, the Bureau uh, determines this, a new center of population. And the, as you can see in this map, uh, the trend sense tends to be further west and south. So in three years, um, it is very likely that a new place will, um, will take the title. But the actual point calculated to be the center of population isn't in the middle of town. It was in the woods two miles away on private property, part of the old Hartsog Ranch. And the true center sits across this pasture and into a thicket where the federal survey team marked the spot with a pile of stones that locals now tend to. Here you can imagine being surrounded equally on all sides by everyone else in America, standing at a statistical center of consensus, a remote balanced fulcrum. So uh, Matt mentioned sometimes we do tours. Uh, this was a different sort of tour. Um, after a year of continuous display here in Lebanon, Kansas, next to the monument indicating the center of the 48 states, the self-contained version of the Centers of the USA exhibit went on tour to visit other centers of the USA, stopping to open to the public at a number of these central locations. And this was the first time we actually used our Facebook page for anything, and we would announce ahead of time, we're, we're approaching Lebanon, Kansas, this date, and sometimes there were people there to meet us, and sometimes there was not. But um, it felt like a nice way to use that tool. Um, the total trip loop would cover about 2,972 miles, um, which is a distance similar to the length of traveling across the USA from coast to coast. If it was a divided in half, we would be back in the middle where we started. So here we are, hitting the road. Um, and the first stop is actually for new tires because it had been sitting there about a year. So on its way, ran into many different curiosities, um, heading south of Kansas City through funny towns, uh, or rather named, funnily named towns. <laughs> um, and uh, to our first stop of Plato, Missouri, the population center of the USA based on the 2010 census. So here we are, right in the middle of town, again, by the post office and by the, the monument. And visitors came through throughout the day. At a point, a group also went uh, to the actual center uh, in the woods. So we had... And then we are back on the road. And um, so uh, heading, heading towards uh, uh, South Dakota, floods actually shut down the interstate and we had to have a detour. Um, and uh, the next day, heading west on Interstate 90, severe thunderstorms threatened in South Dakota. And so the crew actually pulled over to the edge of the highway and stopped. But uh, just then, a gust of wind came and the exhibit unit tips over. And so I actually wasn't on the road part of this, uh, this tour, but I was receiving up to the minute um, notifications from the crew out there, uh, some of those guys, and so, and posting these, sharing these on the Facebook page. And it was, it felt really like we had this group of people that were following the journey of this little exhibition trailer. So we were all in suspense. Um, 
and um, it, it, it tipped over, and uh, but the hitch, you know, it stayed attached to the trailer connecting the two, um, and um, you know the the CHP helped us get it back up, or I'm sorry, not CHP, the the Highway Patrol helped us get it back up, and we were on our way. So back on our way, um, we are headed here to uh, Belle Fourche, the closest town to the geographic center. And here we opened up and passers-by including a number of motorcyclists because um, this happened to be biker week in the nearby city of Sturgis, uh, the largest gathering of motorcyclists in the USA. Um, we also headed to the actual center of the 50 states, which is just north of town. A few more visitors came in here, uh, referred to by the information center in town or from following the uh, Facebook updates of the traveling exhibition unit. After that, the unit went to the remote pullout on Highway 85 to commemorate that more obscure center of the 49 states near Castle Rock, South Dakota. And from there, they, they watch the sound, sun go down. Um, and the next day, they were headed back on, on the road uh, back towards Lebanon. And finally, the exhibit unit returns to Lebanon, Kansas, uh, where it's parked next to an abandoned school. And here, it remains open to the public 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, if you happen to be in that part of the country, you can uh, email us or call a phone number posted on the door, and you'll get a door code that will allow you access to the place to any time of the year. And we can save you the time, if you remember, the code is, is very difficult. It's just one and then two. Um, and, and so it, we are still there, and, uh, and for us it felt like, you know, Lebanon, Kansas, uh, is, uh, the, the 48 states, it's just a lot easier to look at that and point to a point in the middle, and that's Lebanon, Kansas. Um, and, but uh, that being said, it's clear that the closer you look at the way these and many other centers are determined, the more imprecise and even arbitrary they seem. The closer you are, the more detail you can take in, but the more inaccuracies and irregularities become apparent as well. The closer you look, uh, the closer you are, the less you're able to see the big picture and understand the totality. The further you stand back, though, the more you see, but the further away you are, the less connected and more remote you are as well. This is the fundamental paradox of interpretation, if not of experience in general, so it becomes up to each of us to find a balance as individuals. Um, so we can travel these thousands of miles in search of these centers of national significance to see what there is to see on the ground in an attempt to understand this big complex land. Um, the web also enables us to zoom in on what's familiar, on what we decide we want to see, but it also allows us to zoom out uh, beyond our immediate geographic, cultural, and socioeconomic spheres. Um, uniting the macro and the micro, the fringe and the middle, come together to create the whole clear view, one in which the Earth itself is the center of the collective human world. Um, and uh, just speaking of the center of the world, uh, if I have a few more minutes, we can talk about some of the several centers of the world. Um, like this one in Ohio, where uh, the official highway sign, so there's two of them a mile apart, designate this stretch of interstate along Highway 5 as the center of the world. And this was a site of a community that was called the center of the world, established by local businesses and development developer in the 1840s, um, but the development pattern shifted, so it's, uh, it's the railroads coming in, and so uh, the signs are what remain. There's, yeah. If you have a quick thing, there's also um, this other, it's a favorite center of the world for me in Felicity, California, near the Arizona border along Highway 8. And uh, in this, this pyramid, it, it came to a fellow named uh, Jacques-André Estelle in 1985 that the center of the world uh, for him was this place near the Arizona-California border. And so he uh, erected this building there, and in the center is a time capsule as well as a plaque identifying it as the exact center of the world. 
Um, and uh, it's at least acknowledged so by him, him Mr. Estelle, um, and his wife, Felicia, who the town was named after Felicity, um, and the Imperial County Board of Supervisors. And um, it's, um, Home, it's an international place as well. I mean, there are a lot of collection, a collection of funny, interesting landmarks here, including this spiral staircase that um, came from the Eiffel Tower, apparently. Um, and it's a place where you're reminded of time. And uh, perhaps the, the most striking of this uh, compound at the center of the world is this Museum of Granite. And it is an ongoing effort by Mr. Estell and some collaborators to record the entire history of humanity on these granite slabs uh, for perpetuity and also so if something happens, if, if the world humanity ends, whoever comes to find us will be able to, or at least have some clues to decipher um, these ins inscriptions we've left behind. And so as you can see, he's here, he's starting on California, the history of California. There are a lot of slabs, so it's, a, it's an ongoing project. I've been there several times, and this time, um, when this time that this photo was taken was right after uh, Obama's second inauguration, so they were just completing this panel. This, these are not completed yet. Um, and so I guess I'll end on this big question mark, but, um, and, and this thought, um, this quote from Oscar S. Adams, who's the senior mathematician for the US Coast and Geodetic Survey. Since there is no definite way to locate such a point, it would be best to ignore it entirely. The conclusion is forced upon us that there is no such thing as the geographical center of any state, country, or continent. This is a case in which all may be differ, different, but all be right. So, thanks. Now I'd like to introduce Dylan A.T. Minor, as, uh, who's a Mestiz artist uh, engaged in social practice. He's director of uh, American Indian and Indigenous Studies and associate professor at Michigan State University. And his talk uh, today is called Ways of Being, Indigenous Art in an Age of Ongoing Colonialism. Join me in welcoming A.T. Minor. <laughs> So of course, I've changed the title of my talk. Um, and, and so today I'll be talking, uh, the title is Gichi uh, Mukamanan Minwa Gichi Majigak Abukuk, which means uh, basically from big knives to big pipelines. So similar sorts of thoughts and ideas, um, but a bit more engaged. Um, before I start my talk, I'd like to thank uh, Christopher and Rebecca and all the staff and, and, and folks who've helped make this possible. Um, I'd like to also thank all those in administrative and food service and janitorial and cleaning and grounds people who make our presence in this place uh, possible. Um, moreover, uh, two things that I, whoops, uh, two things I like to do before I start, which I've been uh, kind of uh, taught to do, is introduce myself uh, uh, in uh, my ancestral language and then acknowledge the traditional um, stewards of this land, of course, uh, we know we live in a settler colonial nation state here. Um, this part of the territory is historically uh, Mahican territory. Folks were removed, uh, uh, Stockbridge Muncie folks in Wisconsin kind of uh, connect their lineage to this particular place, but it's um, most important to think about this is uh, indigenous territory, this is uh, Algonquian, uh, this is uh, uh, Iroquoian territory. Um, and uh, as you, I ask that you, as you travel, think about the places that you call home and that you uh, kind of uh, uh, move about, uh, acknowledge the, the, the stewards of that land. The university I teach at sits on the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw Territory. <laughs> Botagini uh, Minis, Sakatewak, Red River, Dulizamfante, Awawak. So I usually start and just introduce myself in Machif, uh, which is one of the Metis languages, as well as Anishinaabe uh, Muin. Uh, I live in in, uh, in the Great Lakes in Ojibwe territory. The title of my talk is Anishinaabe Muin. I work uh, quite a bit with uh, 
Anishinaabeg elders, and so I also introduce myself in Anishinaabe Mwen. Ani, Buju, Dylan Minor, and Dijnakas, Jogunashe Mwen, Wisako de Wenini, and do them, Anishinaabe Waki, and Nikwejong, and Donjaba. I'm just to, told you where I was from, who my family is, things of that nature. Um, so I will uh, bore you a bit by reading a paper, but I guess that's what we do as academics. And my apologies, I have a cold, so I've been a little under the weather, and I think my voice uh, um, kind of demonstrates that. Oops. This is a story about images. This is a story about bodies. It is a story about beings. It's about pipes and pipelines. I'll go back one more just to... It is about oil and not about oil paintings. It is, about fra it is fragmented and disjointed. It is a needed intervention for a fossil fuel addicted society such as that we live in, in the capital, capital of scene. It is about the ways that colonialism and capitalism continue to extract so-called resources while enacting violence to indigenous peoples and indigenous ways of being. It is about how images and humans participate in and reproduce this process. Maybe this era instead should be called the colonial scene. Most importantly, this story is, is about mukum, uh, mukamanan, knives and pipes those that communicate with ancestors and those that transport and spill oil. The Anishinaabemowin word for medicine is mishkiki. Many have translated this word to mean strength of the earth. But I wonder how we heal when these uh, mishkikiwan disappear. Today and the weeks leading up to today's talk, I've only begun thinking about and talking about knives and pipes, and as such, my words today are only preliminary. Today's talk is a, is a dibajimwin, that is, it's a narrative. It's not an adisokan, a sacred story. I've heard adisokanag, that's the plural of the word anisokan, I've heard adisokanag described in many ways, which includes traditional or sacred stories, sometimes even myths or legends. I've been told that the adisokanag are those stories that are so significant that they become beings, and know they are being told. Arisokanak are stories, but they're also living beings. These important stories become alive through the process of being told. But today's story is not a sacred story. It's simply a narrative. It's a dibajumun. However, I wonder if this anti-colonial and anti-capitalist story is told in a good way, that if it too will know it's being told and in turn become a being. Can all our stories become beings? As artists and cre uh, creators, as art historians, how do we weave together our precious words and a strand of wingush or sweet grass, that is the hair of Mother Earth? How do we make beings from our stories? How do we present or how do we prevent the ongoing ecological destruction of indigenous territories and the spirits that inhabit them? So this is divided into three parts. One, Bejigo Mukaman, that is one knife. Systematically removing a red utility knife from his back pocket, a man wearing blue pants and a striped shirt with a butterfly collar, hair oddly messy, clearly a cool dude in 1970s England, methodically cuts through the canvas of Sandro Botticelli's Venus and Mars. His Mukaman, or knife, travels clockwise in a series of four straight lines, around the face of Venus in what I reckon could only be a re reproduction of Botticelli's masterwork. I think to myself, ce n'est pas un pipe, that must not be a pipe. And my mind quickly goes to remain, uh, René Magritte's La Traison des Images, The Treachery of Images. If Magritte's pipe, Magritte's pipe is not a pipe, then Berger's Botticelli is neither Venus nor Botticelli. In my mind, Magritte's surrealist pipes, or rather, mental images of digital, digital reproductions, of photographs, of paintings, of pipes, transform and become George Catlin's portfolio of pipes. I care little about Catlin as an artist. 
but he painted pipes, the sacred ones that, smoke, that were smoked in ceremony or used to mark significant event. Some of these pipes were used, uh, were smoked at treaty ceremonies, which settler nation states have uh, consistently ignored. And, and obviously settler colonial tradition that cannot be invented. The reddish brown, fine grained sedimentary rock used to make pipe bowls, what I would call pipe stone, is known as Catlinite, named after the artist who discovered it. As the Smithsonian notes of his legacy, quote, today Catlin's Indian gallery is recognized as a great cultural treasure, offering rare insight into native cultures and a crucial chapter in American history, end quote. And for me, I'm interested in Catlin because he painted pipes and participated in salvage ethnology, believing that his work as an artist was, quote, to res rescue from oblivion the primitive looks and customs, end quote. Botticelli's Venus and Mars is housed in the National Gallery, a true work of art. Catlin's portfolio of pipes is in the British Museum, a work of cultural history. I drift away from John Berger or his engagement with Botticelli's paintings. I mi migrate past Catlin's paintings, which now become the paintings of Swiss artist Peter Rindisbacher, created of what he called half casts around Red River, Manitoba, my community. He painted lots of pipes. Uh, he painted lots of people smoking pipes. He painted Métis voyageurs smoking clay, small, small clay pipes in their Hudson's Bay Company canoes. He painted, in this instance, a Métis woman smoking a long pipe while carrying a baby in a tikanagan, a cradleboard. He painted indigenous folks smoking outside in a variety of environments and people smoking pipes inside teepees. Rindisbacher loved painting people in their pipes. He even painted a self-portrait of himself smoking a pipe. This fall, I employed his image as source material to quickly create an anti dapple image. I think of pipes and ceremonies, and then I go immediately to pipelines and the intimate relationship between extraction and the ongoing dispossession of indigenous peoples of this hemisphere. I think about the Dakota Access Pipeline and fossil fuel extraction as contemporary Indian removal acts. I remember that Donald J. Trump desires to be Andrew Jackson, regardless of Trump's own historical ignorance or revisionism. For indigenous people, these linkages are not coincidental. It was Jackson who initiated the Indian Removal Act on May 28, 1830. It was Trump who signed an executive order on January 24, 2017, approving the completion of the pipeline. But if you've forgotten, and I think I have at this point, I'm still watching John Berger's Ways of Seeing. And the voice of God narration interrupts the sound of Berger's knife slicing through the canvas, which simultaneously punctuates my own thoughts. I no longer even care about Botticelli or Europe or even art history. Rather, in this moment, watching ways of seeing, and in this moment speaking to you today, Berger and his words become the impetus for me to think through an anti-colonial art history and bring Berger's own Western Marxism forward 45 years while simultaneously linking it backward to time immemorial, and most importantly, engaging with a uniquely North American variant of settler colonialism and indigenous studies perspectives. To borrow from Berger himself, as he starts the program, quote, tonight it isn't so much the paintings themselves which I want to consider as the way we now see them. Now in the second half of the 20th century, we're past that, but uh, now in the second half of the 20th century, because we see these paintings as nobody saw them before, we discover why this is so. We shall also discover something about ourselves and the situation in which we are living." End quote. I wonder if today, I wonder if we see extraction or if we see Indians as nobody has seen them before. And I answer my own rhetorical inquiry that I know that these processes are not something new. Only a few seconds into Berger's four-part series, the narrator speaks and asks us, 
the audience, to consider how we understand the process of vision. Berger, as both, as both voice of God and as protagonist, inquires us to discover why we see these paintings like no one has before, discovering something about ourselves in the process. By doing so, and evoking the language of discovery, Berger evokes the same colonial process of claiming and it, that his critique potentially lays bare. I'm less interested in discovery per se than I, am a, than I am with merging Berger's salient critique of capitalism with the potentiality that indigenous ontologies have to challenge the omnipotence of capitalist violence. Moreover, the intersectionality of art and ecology must be foregrounded on indigenous studies, an engagement with a critique of settler colonialism. We cannot even talk about uh, the relationship between art and ecology without indigenous folks and without engaging uh, settler, colonial, uh, settler colonialism. Both Berger and I, I think, are disinterested in the paintings themselves. Whether Berger wants us to question some of the assumptions we have about European painting, a tradition that he notes dies around 1900. This periodization of European painting coincides with the, with the age of empire, which then moves into expansion of capitalism. However, unlike painting, colonialism has not ended. Two, Niju Mukumanan, two knives. Botticelli's Venus and Mars is conveniently housed in the National Gallery London, which is significant to Berger's story, less for mine, but significant in ways that colonial institutions extracted cultural history in a parallel way to the ways that uh, the extraction in industry does so today. I recall as an undergraduate art student back before I had children falling asleep through many of the long and boring lectures on Renaissance painting. You can laugh. Even today, I wonder how and why I'm here at the Clark among so many renowned art historians. Then as now, I often wondered how art historians could do such violence to images by rendering, rendering them, how do you say, boring. You can also laugh, or not. This is my uh, attempt at conference humor. Um, with the lights out, the hum of the slide projector or LCG projector only served as the music to the art historian's lullaby. Inversely, John Berger rocked a butterfly collar and had little concern about the necessary distance between a work of art and its viewer. Each time I watch the opening scene of Ways of Seeing, and it's been many dozen at this point, I smile as if John Berger's knife literally, under, uh, literally undoes the economic and colonial legacy that is objectified in the history of Renaissance painting. How many times have I been in a museum and fantasized about doing exactly what he does. But my Mukaman does dissimilar work to that of J uh, John Berger's knife. Like Berger, I also wield a utility knife, though mine is not red. Mine is, mine is black and silver, or the pocket knife I have in my pocket today is blue. Um, and like Berger, I too remove it from my pocket before I cut into priceless objects. My knife, however, does not slice through canvas to isolate the painted heads within canonical masterworks housed in one of the greatest museums of the world, whose collections were pillaged through European colonial expansion. No, my mukaman or knife is not only an analytical tool to understand Benjamin, Benjaminian theory, either the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction or the work of art in the age of technological reproducibility, depending on which you'd rather cite. <coughs> My knife does, however, have a similar function in that it pierces through the outer bark of a birch tree to harvest wigwas or birch bark. My, my knife is both theoretical and practical. It links what I do in the academy with what I do in the bush and what I do in the community. And with my left hand, I gently grab a sema or tobacco from my pocket and offer this sema to the ancestors and to the tree. I conjure the manidug with, an attempt to, with my attempt at a song before making a small and delicate incision, testing if this particular uh, wigwasetig is ready to share its bark. If the time is right, I make a vertical incision down the tree. Next, I slowly insert the tips of my finger, touching the moisture under the bark, and gently begin to peel the outer bark from the wigwasetig, making sure not to damage the tree 
If the time is right, the wigwas removes itself, echoing the sounds of thunder as it peels itself off the tree. The sweet smell, like it only to a late season watermelon, permeates the air. If done properly, the tree will scar, but will survive. There is in this moment a relationship, an intimate relationship between the tree and me. When harvesting and throughout my life, I wield a, a mukamanets, that is, I wield a small knife. These trees demand it. Like Berger, my knife performs its duties in an esteemed site of so social and cultural importance. In this particular image, I'm in Michigan, the forests of Michigan's Upper Peninsula with Elder Howard Kimowan. In Nishnabemwin, the lingua franca of the Great Lakes indigenous world, the term for an American or a white person is Gichi Mukaman. Literally, the term translate is someone who carries a big knife. In an indigenous worldview, colonial agents carried and wielded big knives in their assault on indigenous sovereignties, epistemologies, and ontologies. After four decades on this earth, I'm certain that not much has changed. Inversely, as carriers of small knives, both Berger and I challenged the Gichi Mukamanamwin, that is, the capitalist, colonial, and heteropatriarchal ontologies. Three, Gichi Majiga Abkuk, big pipelines. Oh, and these are just some of the things made with the, sorry, I skipped this. Um, these are some objects I've made. If Gichi Mukamannan was used to describe those who wielded the power of settler colonialism, that is, big knives, it is possible that our descendants will call those who benefit from this moment in time Gichi Majig Agbkuk, big pipelines. If early colonialism was a, mo a violent task wielded by the West, oops, was if, uh, if early colonialism was a violent task wielded, wielded by the weapons of war, Today's colonial project is maintained through state-sanctioned and market-based weaponry. But these are similarly used to dismantle indigenous sovereignty and relationships to and knowledge with the land. These weapons are not better, and they are qualitatively just as destructive. And these next images I show are all mine. As David Blackman wrote for Forbes less than two weeks ago, quote, DAPL, the Dakota Access Pipeline, has already begun to improve the economics of drilling for and producing oil from the back in shale, whose rig count has begun to rise over the last few months. And while the aggressive and often, often violent protesters who spent a half year opposing the project's completion would never admit it, DAPL is already improving the safety of moving back and crude out of the basin and to be sold and refined, end quote. While I, while I, would, uh, while I would disagree with Blackman's account of the uh, account of the water protectors as, quote, aggressive and often violent, end quote. We can nevertheless see that the Indian Wars continue. These, str <coughs> excuse me. These struggles, these indigenous struggles, are not about the safety of moving oil, but rather the ontological and epistemological desires to even need to extract those fossil fuels in the first place. In Canada, a nation state where indigenous issues are more visible than the, in the United States, yet where indigenous peoples consider themselves living in apartheid-like conditions, native communities are supposed to have free, prior, and informed consent before extraction proceeds. Yet as we saw this winter, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said that indigenous peoples, particularly in reference to the uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations of British Columbia who oppose pipelines, that they, quote, no, they do not have a veto, end quote. Trudeau subsequently approved the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Settlers have gone from big knives to big pipelines. If John Berger taught me to read oil paintings to understand the machinations of capitalism, as well as the functions of cisgendered male gaze, it is now our task to read oil and the machinations of settler colonialism. As Eve Tuck and K. Wayne Yang so forcefully write, quote, Decolonization brings about the repatriation of indigenous lands and life. It is not a metaphor for other things we want to do to improve our societies and schools. To reiterate, decolonization is not a metaphor. <laughs> 
In the Great Lakes where I make my home, we faced the potential oil spill from Enbridge Line 5, an aging pipeline that was built in 1953. The pipeline moves oil from Western Canada through Wisconsin across the Straits of Mackinac to Sarnia, Ontario. Anishinaabeg Kwe activist Vanessa Gray has brought attention to the ecological violence enacted against citizens of her nation, Amjwanong First Nation, and their home in Canada's Chemical Valley, which is right there in Sarnia across the river from Port Huron, Michigan. The pipeline runs beneath the Straits of Mackinac, a sacred site for Anishinaabeg peoples, but also an ecologically significant location between Lakes Michigan and Huron, which share a common watershed. Any spill would decimate the lakes. The struggles against pipelines and mineral extra extraction is not a new one, but in this moment, indigenous peoples have the most at stake. Decolonization is not a metaphor. By reading oil instead of oil paintings, we can hopefully facilitate the repatriation of indigenous life and land, to reference back to Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang. This includes the Dakota Access Pipeline, Keystone XL, Line 5, and the new open, and the new, uh, open pit mine in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, the Back 40 Project. These are some Back 40 Project images. And so just let me end by saying this. I'm from the perspective that any eco-critique must first commence with indigenous issues and involve indigenous communities. However, settlers, indigenous, and arrivants alike must choose whether to carry a big knife or a small one. Jimmy Gwich, Marseille, thank you. Thank you all <laughs> for those great talks. Um, maybe I'll open it up first and see if anybody has a burning question. It's a little hard to see. No? Yeah. Oh, Verity? Thank you. Those are all riveting. And um, my question is mainly for Aurora. Um, you showed us beautifully without having to spell it out, and I feel silly for saying it now, how did the sense of you know, the constant deferral and kind of undoing of itself, the search for the center is, and the contrast with these more embodied forms of geographical knowledge that we heard about from Jessica and Dylan is very stark. Um, and I wondered, when the exhibition went on tour, how did people who lived in those multiple centers actually engage with it as inhabitants of those spaces? Um, I wasn't on the tour, but I can communicate what I heard from our colleagues that were on the tour. But um, in some towns, there were people waiting for this little trailer to arrive, and there was some excitement that there um, was attention being paid to these centers. And they're not all the same, clearly, but uh, some already have um, quite a lot of uh, infrastructure that showcases that pride, while others do not. Um, but, um, yeah, can you add anything to that on your Well, there, there's a bit of a center competition going oh, on um, between the centers, you know, uh, for significant relevance. So I think one undercurrent that I detected a little bit, which was unexpected, it was how some of the people at one center were like, well, you know, why should we care about these other centers? We're the center. And it's like, well, you should. You're, you're, you've, you're, it's a community of centers uh, that you're part of. And they didn't want to be part of that community of centers at all because it undermined their, their centrality. <laughs> maybe, maybe we're part of that community of centers now, too, as the Center for Land Use Interpretation picking Lebanon, Kansas, as our site for <laughs> our Centers of the USA exhibit trailer. Yeah, I felt bad. Finally, we voted, you know, which is the most center-like thing where we should put our, our exhibit to stay in perpetuity, and we selected Lebanon. 
because it felt most like the center. Uh, and <laughs> they're, thereby sort of undermining our whole argument about there not being a center. How, but there has to be a center. I mean, that's, that's the paradox is that even though there can't be a center because there's not any real way to empirically measure it and create it, there has to be. In the middle of every shape is a, is a middle, and there, so there is a center. So just like societally, we have a hard time coming together, I think, you know, geographically, it's a similar manifestation of the same problem, and yet it has to be resolved. There has to be a decision. There has to be a center. These things have to cohabitate. Um, and we subjectively decided that Lebanon felt to us like the center of all the centers. Yeah, I, so I wanted to see if, um, if the three of you could put your talks in dialogue with one another. And one of the ways that I thought I imagined to do that was, has to do with the idea of land use, right? Um, that I, I wonder to what extent the, the kind of the framework of land use and the, the interpretation of land use um, reifies particular uses, um, assumes that there's, you know, that assumes that there's, an, there's not a possibility of non-use. Um, I mean, I, you know, I just, I sort of wonder from, you know, from the point of view of CLUI, is there, you know, are there places where you think about um, land that's, that's actually not used or designated as not used or where there's uh, a really, I mean, very, um, heated contestation over how it should be used, right? Where there are parties who, um, who you know, disagree violently. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, just you know, maybe if Dylan too, if you, could, if you could kind of speak to the question of, of how, how to think about um, kind of this, this sort of documentation of the use of land. Well, just a quick note about, um, I guess in these land that may not seem to be used, like, or there's a con in that making that conscious effort to not use it, that is in a way humans are, are, are shaping its use. Um, so in that way, we feel like that, that doesn't really exist in, in uh, land in the US that's free of land use. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. It, it, yeah, use by not using it's a use, uh, and that uh, uh, you know we manage the entire landscape in one way or another, uh, and every molecule has been affected by human agency and is therefore a human product, uh, and is just about sort of allocation and uh, um, yeah. So I'd say all land is used in that sense, and that's part of this, you know colonialist perspective or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it is. And, and that's a given, you know, we kind of start with that as a given that, A, we're looking at things from a kind of a, you know, a, a, a biased point of view of the culture, the dominant culture in this landscape. And by looking at, you know, something as evasive as what is an American culture, right? Uh, you know, we're very conscious of the fact that American culture doesn't really exist in some sense and also it doesn't stop at the boundaries of the country it's a you know it, it's sort of just like the atomic bomb it went off in 1945 and and spread all over the globe you know uh so it's uh, you know this you know imperialism is the the current age it's as modern times it's it's the american epoch uh at the moment, and it has been for a while, but it sort of really took off in 1945, you know, World War II, when our, our sort of uh, uh, political uh, capital uh, flowed across the world, and also our, our methods of mass production and consumer culture and the technologies developed during the war were kind of infiltrated into the culture and economy, and and uh, the modern era began. And so for us, looking at land use really almost looks back only as far as 1945 in a way. That, in a way, that's when most of the stuff you see when you look out the landscape, that's where it came from. A little less maybe in some parts of the colonial Northeast, but, but most of the country, when you see things, it's stuff that was made in the past 60, 70 years. You know? 
Uh, so it's a very modern world. Yeah, and, and I would say that kind of land use is at the center of indigenous sovereignty issues, whether it's the ability to fish or hunt or harvest or use lands in particular ways. If we, in Michigan, you had the, 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 the fishings or, or harvesting um, uh, legal cases against the states. Uh, Wisconsin had them as well. And I think that those are in some ways some of the, the foregrounds, uh, the ways that indigenous uh, nations kind of assert sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis the state. And, and in some ways, maybe uh, gaming is in the same way. It's a, it's a, it's a loophole within within uh, kind of uh, legal structures where uh, you know uh, Indian casinos can exist as a way of revenue generation that can benefit uh, enrolled citizens, can create uh, community centers and language revitalization programs. So in some ways, those are all linked to land use. And in in and when you look at you know when you start looking at the various ways settler colonial histories and maybe sarah will could talk about this but uh sarah can is thinking about uh, the project she did on uh, on black hawk but the ways that settler colonial legacies kind of then both appropriate the stories of indigenous histories as well at the same time that they're appropriating land and its use so um you know when we start going backward and forward in time um Right now, I'm enamored with this concept, this term, which I've used a bunch, uh, called anikubijigan. Um, it's an Anishinaabe Muin word, which, ta which is the same word used for one's uh, uh, great-grandparent as for one's great-grandchild. Um, kind of thinking about the ways that uh, temporality is not simply kind of, you know, historicity is not a, a one-dimensional thing, that when we start thinking about land uses across time, both backward and forward simultaneously, um, you know, we get into very complex notions uh, that, 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 that don't work well against settler colonial Western notions of the nation state and certain juridical structures, which become so much more difficult. So, you know, when, when, we, when, when you know, we look at the borders, the four corners of the United States, we're looking at a nation state, we're looking at the, the violence that those borders do to indigenous nations, abilities to migrate back and forth across, you know, um, I didn't do it in this, but when I when I do one of my talks, I show a map, a Google map Earth uh, image of the Great Lakes, and my family was on a, an island in, in Lake Huron called uh, Potagini Minas, um, which in English is called Drummond Island, but after the War of 1812, basically the border, that shifted to the American side, and since my family fought with the, the British against the, the Americans, uh, all of those allies were kicked to the other side. So the violence that border does in terms of uh, the ways that, it's, uh, that affects indigenous peoples is, is quite, quite real. Um, and so, you know, while you can have these, these uh, you know, swaths of the border, well, what does that mean for indigenous harvesting rights, for the assertion of sovereignties, all of these things? And, and I just love the way the international boundary between Canada and the U.S. dissolves in places like Cornwall Island, and, and, and there, there is no line anymore. It's just the reservation's boundary. Uh, and then famously, that, that border inspection station on Cornwall, which was shut down, it's like a phantom toll booth now. It's an unoperated uh, Canadian port of entry, or it was an American port of entry that was, you know, <laughs> but, but it, it, uh, they didn't want to have armed Canadian border patrol people on the res, so they, they outlawed the, the the border crossing on, on Cornwall. And, and, and even the production of kind of the, the creation of reservation lands and the seeding of lands, there's lots of territories that are conceded, considered unceded territory or, you know, you, 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 you would use land differently, uh, you know, kind of in the Great Lakes you have, you have sugar bush camps which you use in, in late spring and then you have hunting camps and then you have the, these other communities. So even those, they're temporal and so when you create permanent relationships to place that are sedentary, it, it, it does violence to one's ability to exist in the world, um, which oftentimes uh, governance structures are tied to that. So what does it mean when you, dis when you kind of remove, say, on the plains, the buffalo hunt? Government structures were connected to the buffalo hunt. Well, the buffalo are gone, so you kind of you, you, you destroy you know, an indigenous notion of governance and governmentality. Um, all of these, th these things are you know, linked together in, in, in very uh, uh, tenuous ways. Um, thank you all for your talks, which are all really fascinating. I wanted to, um, I thought of sort of one uh, thing, that tension that kind of runs through all of your papers, and I was hoping you could say something, a few words about that, each of you. Um, and this was really the, um, 
the kind of tension between the abstract and the ecological as a form, because what struck me was that, you know, the border, anything that's a border or that's a pipeline is sort of, um, uh, there's a sense that it needs to be a straight line or something calculated for maximum efficiency, whereas it t it's completely uh, in opposition to sort of natural borders, we might call them like rivers or, or, or you know, mountain ranges, um, or um, ways that one might naturally move through the landscape to transport something from one place to another. Um, and so, um, it, the the talks about center and periphery really brought this to uh, you know dramatize this in the kind of absurdity that takes place at centers and and borders um, and I think the similarly the um, um, the Dylan your talk about um, the the pipeline um, brings that tension to another kind of economic um, you know much more politicized in economic sense. And so I don't know if maybe I'm, this isn't quite a question, but I guess it's really for us to think about not just the three of you, but also others here to think about whether ecology has, you know, uh, whether abstraction of ways of understanding geography is in, in tension with ecological thought perhaps or something of that. Who was it who said uh, there are no straight lines in nature, right? I, mean, I, I don't know if they've disproved that or not by now, but uh, uh, in general, it seems that way. I mean, even the border between Canada and the US, for example, is actually 11,000 and some perfectly straight lines, even where it follows rivers. So the shortest of those lines is a few feet, the longest is a few hundred miles, which is surveyed on either end as a turning point subsequent to its next straight line. So even the rivers, which are, you know, completely dendritic and chaotic and changing, uh, are mapped with these straight lines that no longer are in the riverbed at all. You know, a hundred years have elapsed since it was surveyed or whatever, and now these, this zigzag of straight lines is in many cases even a half mile away from where the river is now, that the, the river was determined to be the boundary, but now it's this weird zigzag in some cornfield or whatever next to the river. Uh, so you see this same, you know, this, these notions of what's sensible, which is sort of to map places according to drainage, right? And, you know, I mean, if we were to have to redo the states in the Union, God forbid, we, you know, maybe we, we do it along, you know, the watersheds, right? Because that's actually, those are the lines that mean something in the landscape rather than these abstract surveyor marks based on treaties that we didn't end up respecting anyway. But uh, so it seems to me this whole notion of what's sensible and rational in terms of landscape and land use are, is the is the a kind of a a mutable and changing environment that we can't harness so that is another form of paradox our need to control space and to be able to set meets and bounds and boundaries and etc is is some based on a system of of uh, having to create surveyor structures that don't follow the natural or sort of common sense uh, divisions of landscape, but that's just the nature of our systems of economics, capitalism, whatever, you know, we need to do this sort of abstraction on a landscape that is fluid and kinetic and beyond our, our grasp. Two thoughts that are totally disconnected from your question, um, <laughs> but uh, just like my talk, kind of uh, connecting things up in this way. Um, one, uh, I read it, or some elders have told me, um, some rocks are living, but not all are. Um, and as you were kind of talking about straight lines and borders, I was just thinking about that, that not all rocks are alive, but some of them are, um, you know. Um, and the other one was, uh, as Jessica's talk was earlier, and she was showing the, the transition from work on, on Hyde to, to work on muslin. Um, I, uh, I conducted a workshop and gave a workshop on folks how to brain tan, uh, make buckskin with, with animal brains. Um, and when you do that, you, you create this relationship with the material. 
right? This is an animal that either you've killed or this was one that someone had poached and we, we processed it. Um, but you're literally squeezing the brains of the animal into the flesh of the animal and then wearing that animal, right? So you're literally wearing this experience and kind of um, creating a practice uh, where you're embodying uh, the experiences of this other being. Um, and, and, and so I think that, you know, when you create geopolitical borders, boundaries between nation states uh, and fictive ones between states within the union, when you create uh, these sorts of boundaries which affect in, uh, you know, people's ability to do these things and have these relationships um, uh, with the world around them, you create uh, very real violence and ongoing violence. Um, so those were two things that had nothing to do with your question, um, but in some ways I think they might have something to do with your question. I, I want to just follow up on that, and this is not super well formed, um, so just going off of you know questions that may or may not relate, but I'm um, thinking about with uh, uh, in, in your work in this, with the center, this idea of inscription and inscription of uh, culture uh, on the landscape and and dealing with you, your your knife and the and the birch bark and sort of printing and communicating th through a kind of engraving and ins inscription, um, you know, to to kind of uh, communicate uh, you know an idea. And I'm just I'm just curious if you could say more about um, you know this idea of inscription and imprinting. I'm, I'm an image maker. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like to make images. Uh, I like to make images that are didactic and quickly communicable um, in terms of the graphics. Um, I also have a project called Anishina Ben Sabim Squib Shkigiwag Native Kids Ride Bikes, where we do workshops with youth, where we make low rider bikes based on the teachings of the elders. Um, it's not an inscription, but it's reproducible in, I think, a very similar way. And, and, and we could say the same thing about, uh, about one's relationship with a tree. It's about, um, I think, printing uh, and, and inscriptions about a relationship between, uh, between humans or between beings, between uh, us and others. Um, and I think that's kind of much of my practice, much of my thinking is about that. It's about the creation. I'm a socially awkward, strange person. And, um, and so I kind of make to fill that void. Um, I guess um, for me at the center, um, I came to it from, you know, I studied art history undergrad and focused on 1960s, 1970s American land art. And it really blew me away, this idea of uh, landscape literacy and how I could look at things like, I was looking at things like Robert Smithson's Spiral Jetty um, and, you know, Road and Crater and things and how I could look at, you know, Bingham, Bingham Mine Copper Pit, which is near the Spiral Jetty and which Robert Smithson was also enamored by, but I didn't know anything about and how I could go there and look at it. Just, I'm a visual person and visually look at things like, oh, wow, I can look at these in the same aesthetic terms as I would maybe a, a sanctioned piece of land art. And it's all, um, it's all land use. It's all uh, shaping the earth, changing it in some way. And so I guess, uh, yeah, with, for me, it was just making, it's a different way of seeing. And we think, we talk about uh, uh, land art uh, sometimes at the Center for Land Use Interpretation, sanctioned land art, and how it can be used as a perceptual tool in a way, and how uh, the closer you get to sanctioned land art, like the spiral jetty, um, everything around it, on the route, on this pilgrimage, becomes imbued with significance. The way you take in the landscape, you're looking for things, it really changes. And for me, it became, land art became a way to access everything else that was going on in the place. Um, and find that, you know, oh, that oil jetty over there is equally, is, or maybe even more interesting than the spiral jetty. And um, so I guess the, that reading of the landscape for me comes from, from that. Yeah, I think we call that the land, land art spillover effect. Yeah. <laughs> Where, yeah, the closer you get to a piece of land art, the more interesting everything else gets. Uh, uh, as you draw in the context. Uh, and, and, but, you know, and we try and sustain that kind of engagement and legibility of the landscape 
after you've left the land art. So in a way, institutionally, we're trying to create that effect on people uh, and whatever it takes to get them to be engaged in understanding and reading the landscape around them in order to be part of it a little more as they go through their lives and make their decisions. And uh, so if, you know, if it has to be this sort of, you know, 1300 foot long spiral in the lake that, you know, gives you enough, you know, has enough authority that you feel that you can uh, uh, begin to look at things as, you know, in an engaged way, then so be it. Um, it's, it's a Trojan horse, maybe, <laughs> but not entirely. I mean, all, it's, it's a kind of a, uh, a perspectival device, like Aurora was saying, uh, kind of a, you know, some kind of optical device in a way, of create new ways of seeing. Uh, but it's also, I don't think that was entirely missing from Smithson's mind when, when he made that. I think the, the journey, the pilgrimage, all of that was supposed to be part of it. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, I mean, land art, uh, I thought we were exploring some interesting terrain too, talking about the sort of decay of land art. And uh, I believe you had a really nice comment uh, uh, about uh, developing a sort of a poesy or a poetic way of looking at decay without being so romantic. Uh, and that that's interesting. Uh, and I believe you know, part of also what we're trying to do sort of institutionally in a way. Uh, create a sort of a poetry out of our relationship with space and to have have decay, entropy, whatever, you know, this sort of de decomposition of things as part of the other half of life, you know, along with the construction, you have destruction and the two work together and we're somewhere in the middle and just like we're in the middle between being flooded out by you know, climate change and drying out on the other side, you know, we try and inhabit the margin between the, the extremes, we try and and carve our way through life looking, you know, between disintegration and, and creation. Um, and so these are notions, I think, that are fundamental to humans. And I'm curious, too, to hear more uh, about your views of those kinds of things. And in particular, I mean, I, I feel like, personally, I can learn so much from uh, from the First Nation and uh, you know, native point of view about the American landscape, but it's almost like a parallel universe. Uh, you know, it seems like a parallel universe that sort of bubbles up in places, but is, it's, it's, it's America's Chinatown, and uh, it's a, a place, you know, of darkness uh, and regret and remorse and horror, and so I, I often avoid it perhaps more than I should, uh, but I'm, I'm glad that you're so eloquent in, in bringing up some of these ideas in this, this kind of context. There's two, two, three, three questions. Hi, um, Dylan, I was wondering if you, thank you so much for all of these great papers. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how um, you're conceptualizing agency, especially in the face of ongoing colonial violence. Um, and I was really struck by your use of the knife as sort of a repurposing of a repurposing of violence to achieve different kinds of intimacies between different material forms. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about, again, how you're thinking about agency or if there are um, different metrics by which you're sort of thinking about, you know, vitality, animacy that you're, um, that you're using. Yeah. Um, yeah, good, a good question. Um, I'm not, I, I don't know if I'm intentionally thinking about agency. I'm thinking about um, the ways, uh, I mean, clearly I'm engaged in uh, critiques of, of structural violence and ongoing structural violence um, and what could be called agency in the ways that uh, indigenous peoples respond to that, um, whether it's uh, myself or the collective action, say at Standing Rock, or the way that all of these things happen, uh, uh, emerge together. Um, you know, I, I, I think that um, maybe, maybe this will, again, as a way to, to respond to, to questions by not responding to questions. Um, a few years ago, there was a conference at the University of Toronto called Decolonial Aesthetics. And at that gathering, a tension emerged between basically folks involved in uh, the, the notion of the decolonial option or decoloniality 
an indigenous artist and activist from the global north. Um, there was, on the one hand, an inability to, to speak to one another, but I think at its core, there were, um, at the core, the, the discussion was whether or not anything could exist outside of capitalism and colonialism. And from an indigenous perspective, there is an outside, there is a non-colonial. And, and I think this is where I'm trying to get to, to notions of agency. You know, um, as someone who's kind of trained in, in, in decolonial theory and understands, uh, say, Anibal Quijano's notion of, uh, uh, what is it, the, the, it's not the matrix of power, the, um, the matrix, so help me out, folks. Uh, his, his notion, no, no Quijano uh, uh, scholars in here. Um, anyway, basically, for, for Anibal Quijano, the, the great uh, Peruvian uh, sociologist, right, everything is encapsulated, is, is contained within the coloniality, right? Um, and so while there can be kind of oppositions to it or slight movements against it, nothing exists outside of it. And I think that from an indigenous perspective, right, uh, on the one hand, I know that capitalism uh, affects me and my my actions on, a, on every given day, right? The fact that I uh, burned uh, basically the bodies of ancient beings to get here, right? I drove a, I drove a car to get here and participated in, in the the ecological destruction of this planet, right? I mean, there's a there's a uh, there's a tension there, um, and 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 in a, in a clearly knowledgeable one. Um, so. At this conference, I started thinking about those tensions between kind of indigenous abilities and uh, ways to exist outside of the colonial, uh, out of coloniality, out of, outside of capitalism, and those that wanted to encapsulate everything within it. Um, and I think that for me, um, there, there's two things that happen on, uh, at the same time. There's one which is, a, which is an intentional anti-capitalist and anti-colonial move which is, say, the, the no pipelines on indigenous land, the no pipelines in the Great Lakes, the no pipelines near sacred sites, all of those are an intentional confrontation with those, uh, with those violent and problematic structures. And then there's those other ones that exist to some extent outside of, 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 of those structures, and that's harvesting bark with an elder. It's, I have a project where uh, my grandfather's grandfather was arrested for poaching a deer on traditional lands in Ontario's Georgian Bay in 1906. So I go back there uh, every year um, to harvest or, or attempt to harvest an animal, right? Um, but as a, a Métis person who lives on the U.S. side, I don't have the legal ability to do so. Um, so there are these ways that, uh, you know, I try to directly confront uh, and challenge a system, and there's ways that kind of I try to exist outside of that system. And I think that that's, that's what, one of the ways that I'm thinking through or potentially engaging with, with agency, if unintentionally so. One more question, yeah. Sorry, I'm trying also to make sense of the, uh, of the session here, and uh, not that I'm trying to bypass the colonial question, because I think that it's something that could bind the, the, the uh, presentation that we hear here, but I'm trying to go actually to the basic thing about making a sense of a place by creating a center and creating margin, which is a normal work of giving meaning to a chaos and a, uh, creating a kind of order into something which is chaotic or not defined. And I don't have to tell you that the landscape that we have seen while traveling to this semi-centers uh, were definitely not defined by a big mountain or a, a specific spot that you can immediately call it center. So I see it as a process of making order, you know, like making order in art history in calling the medieval medieval or, or calling in a collection a centerpiece, a centerpiece of a collection. So, uh, but I, 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 I wonder if you were thinking of the aesthetic practices that were taking part in making these centers. The pharaonic aesthetic was quite clear with the pyramid, with the obelisk, with the granite. I mean, uh, who are the people behind this decision making of making these centers centers? Well, I think it, it varies. It depends on which center. But um, for example, that last one I showed, uh, which is a bit of an unusual one, a self 
an, an individual decided to build that, and it, it's a, in a way a visionary uh, a monument, um, and it came from his dream, and he told me, I sat down with him, he told me it, uh, he had a dream involving a dragon, and so he's actually created a uh, book, a ch it's a children's book. So, I, And I, I was trying to figure out when I was sitting with there how if he really believed, sincerely believed this was the center of the world, or what compelled him if it was a joke, or, and, um, and I, I'm not 100% certain, but I think it was a, a sincere attempt for him to kind of understand. He's also French, I should mention, and a French parachutist, and so one thing, you know, maybe parachutists are, are very good with landing on their targets or, or think in a different way than I do, perhaps, with a center bullseye or you have to land. Or, and again, it comes out to trying to just understand or define and so you create these systems. And for him, that was it, maybe. And then, of course, the pyramid, I mean, it was, is imbued with so much significance and, um, you know, this, in a way, also his, just how you're reminded of time there. And it's, it's in a way he's building this forever architecture, structures meant to withstand human lifetime. And so um, it's, it's totally subjective. <laughs> and, um, but I think he's very well aware of the meaning, the significance behind these symbols he's bringing in. Um, but that's just one uh, no, he's he's a he's a land artist he's essentially. A land artist, yeah. yeah. He's a visionary uh, who, who world just builder. Yeah, who doesn't read the same art history books as everybody else? But, uh, and I think in a way that's all, each one of these centers is is a kind of a unintentional or in some cases intentional, uh, you know, land art or cultural product and artwork in a way. Uh, and I don't know. I, I might argue that in general you, you can you know we kind of create a frame for looking at the world that is a little more um, artistic, you know, I guess you could say, so that potentially anything you look at can be seen as interesting and valuable if it's, if it's contextualized in the right way. And uh, so some of these stories are boring, some of them are, are plain, and some of them are dramatic, and, uh, but all of them are kind of pitiful or dramatic or successful attempts in understanding our relationship to the earth in different ways. And uh, uh, so we, we were just kind of by creating a, an exhibit, a curating a collection of sites, if you will, uh, then we're creating a, some kind of narrative of, uh, of a kind of a display about examples of people's attempts to try and explain the world to themselves. So, and uh, to feel part of it. Uh, whether or not we succeed in our programming to tell interesting stories, I'll let you decide, but, uh, but that is you know, kind of what we're doing, telling stories about the American place and landscape through the lenses of its denizens. Uh, so it's, uh, yeah, each, each, it's not always fascinating, but in general also I find that a lot of times the most boring places are actually the most interesting places because you haven't thought about them as much and so they're full of things that you haven't uh, sort of uh, you know, encountered. And uh, so you know, we've done tours into gravel pits and things like that, you know, which uh, end up really being exciting and fascinating. And uh, so uh, everything out there is, is a potential uh, tale of uh, potential interest if you, you know, it's constructed in a, you know, hopefully informed and compelling way. Do you want to comment on that question, Dylan? Or? Oh, geez. <laughs> Maybe we should go back to the question, just in terms <laughs> of, uh, uh, I got lost in Matthew's uh, response here. Uh, it, I mean, the question was, more about the aesthetic praxis that is being taken in creating points of center and marginality in space, and how they are bound still to cultural aesthetic practices of history of art, actually. Yeah. I mean, than indigenous, I mean, I mean, when I'm trying to, to, to tailor now the question to you. <laughs> 
Um, but I mean, you, 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 uh, you, you prefaced it with kind of, we didn't want get, to get binded by uh, the colonial question, and I'll respond in a way that goes back to the kind of the notion <laughs> of settler colonialism, because I would say that those centers are always emerging from co settler colonial notions of power. Um, and, and particularly in this nation state, whether, that, whether it's Washington DC or, or, or New York or Chicago or Los Angeles, right? And when we start kind of linking these up, I think that's what's, you know, uh, to some extent interesting about these other centers is they're, they're using the language of centers within, you know, kind of uh, to, to imagine centers that aren't really centers but are centers. Um, and, 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 and in some ways you could do the same um, when you start engaging in practices, say out in, out in the bush, when you start relating to uh, the natural environment and engaging in practices that might not be art uh, practices, might not be our historical um, uh, projects, but when one re relates and understands a particular place, right, there's aesthetic relationships to that territory, to that particular uh, site. So if, if it's someone goes back, if someone's family has a relationship to a space, um, what does that mean? Um, how do the practices, are there, a, you know, I, I find, you know, just going back to the notion of brain tanning, I mean, there's something beautiful about kind of literally making uh, an object by smushing the brains of that same object into itself. Um, and, 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 and that's, of course, then mediated by, by the politics of the nation state. So for me, uh, you know, I, 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 get hard, I get hard pressed to get outside of, of the binds of, of the nation state um, because those are, to, to some extent, containing and confining even aesthetic practices, even basic everyday practices, that those, those are there, whether they're mediating or moderating or prohibiting or preventing or the practices that are done have to be done in spite of, right? Those are always there in relationship to those practices. Okay, well, I think we have to close, but um, let's thank our speakers.